Machen wir mal Stück mehr. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> Thank you, Ellie and Mushke, for um, inviting me. One could say that today's event is somewhat a collision of worlds. Um, the world of 18th century Hasidism and the world of the contemporary secular university. Now, sometimes a collision can be catastrophic. But as we're seeing today, as we're hopefully going to see more, as we see the printing of the Tanya, this is a, a collision that is creating tremendous, robust energy and importance for the future of both Chabad and campus here in Manchester, and please God, also the University of Manchester. When the father of monotheism, Abraham, arrived in the land of Israel, then the land of Canaan, which was later going to be promised to his descendants for all eternity. He called out in the name of God, and he said, he referred to God in, these, in, a, in a peculiar Hebrew term, Kel Olam, God world. Not Kel Ha'olam, not God of the world. And the Baal Shem Tev, the founder of Hasidism, emphasized how the whole purpose of Abraham was to articulate, was to elaborate, was to reveal how there is no distinction between God and the world, between godliness, between holiness, between materialism, and between worldliness. This marriage today of the printing of a Tanya in a place of higher education, such as the University of Manchester, and in this beautiful, beautiful library, is a testament to that ambition of Avram Avinu, of our forefather Abraham, who wanted to see the possibility that all that we consider holy and divine can find expression and articulation even in places which sort of historically um, have seen themselves going in a slightly different direction. Now, this sense of a sort of a division, a disunity, um, a lack of common purpose between the ideals of the Tanya first articulated hundreds of years ago and the ambitions of the Enlightenment, which finds its sort of fruition and its culmination in the modern secular university, can lead a person to think today can be explained in two ways. One could think that on the one hand, maybe this is a, uh, this is a takeover. This is somehow, and you could look at it in both ways. Could it be that the ideas of the Tanya have now overcome all of the objections of secular enlightenment, such that there is a happy, a happy marriage, a happy, uh, happy way in which we can think of printing a Tanya in such a place? Alternatively, could we say that the Tanya has finally given in, given in to the forces of modernity, and has understood that the only true place in which the Tanya should be printed and should be studied is in a place of critical inquiry that sees beyond and is not in, doesn't feel incumbent to the spiritual and the divine. However, I think all of us know that those dichotomies, those oppositional binaries which we set up for ourselves, have no place here. And in truth, what is going on today is, in my view, um, a transformative attempt at seeing beyond what is often seen as a very uh, argumentative debate between the ambitions of the spirit and the ambitions of our secular material society. In fact, we see in the Tanya, most, most poignantly in the second section, an attempt by Rabbi Shneer Zalman to recognize how in everything that's created, it's not just understood as being an act of creation that was thousands of years ago. 
but there is a continuous mode of creation whereby the divine is making sure that everything that we see and we hear is being brought back into existence at every single moment. By accentuating this point, Rabbi Shneur Zalman is really pushing us to try and see beyond those dualisms that are, are so prevalent in all forms of society, be they religious or secular, that there is somehow a difference between the divine creating force and the material physical world in which it manifests. But in no play, in addition to this more general sense of moving beyond that opposition of the spirit and the matter, we see this articulated very pointedly in chapter 32 of the Tanya, part of which we're going to study now, with a slight introduction. In 1982, a doctoral student submitted a PhD thesis to the University of London, and the title of which was Rabbinical Concepts or Rabbinic Concepts of Responsibility for Others, A Study of the Commandment of Rebuke and the Idea of Mutual Surety. As someone who had a relationship with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe requested that he sends a copy of his dissertation so that the Rebbe could look it over. A short while later, he receives a reply and some comments, one of which was, I'm surprised that you could write such a large thesis all about the idea of responsibility for others and not make one mention of chapter 32 in Tanya. Many years later, that doctoral student, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, went back and thought again about what, what was wrong. What did the Rebbe really want from him? Because when he received the reply, he was slightly nonplussed. What, what exactly did the Rebbe want? He was writing about rabbinic concepts. He was writing about halachic concepts. The Tanya is a work of Jewish thought, Jewish mysticism, Jewish philosophy, and which wasn't really the focus of his dissertation. However, he came to realize that without taking into consideration the ideas that are articulated in chapter 32 of Tanya, we will fail to truly appreciate what it means to be responsible for others and to fulfill the commandment of love your neighbor as yourself. The standard halachic and, dare I say, contemporary understanding of being responsible for other people relies on a sense that in order for the betterment of society, in order for my own uh, survival, I have to treat others in a way that I would like to be treated myself. However, at the core of that idea is a love, a love of the other, which is dependent on something. It's both dependent on your own sense of what it means to survive, and it's dependent on the extent to which you need to be kind and generous to the other person. But there is really no compulsion to be mahadab a mitzvah. There's no compulsion to really indulge in this mitzvah, this commandment to be generous, kind, responsible for other people. The bare minimum, sufficient, in order to survive, would surely be enough. In Tanya, the Alter Rebbe gives us a sense that so long as we think about survival, we think about what is good for us, and we think about our separateness and our distinctiveness from everyone else around us and how we're going to navigate that difference, we are going to be left only with division and with disunity. It's only when a person is sensitive to their spirit, to their soul, and how that spirit and soul is synonymous with everyone else's spirit and soul, that a person can come to a new realization of what it means to love another Jew. In the words of the Tanya,
when a person considers that a lifestyle that is only indulgent in physical material pursuits alone will not be able to achieve true love of a fellow. Only when their joy is a joy of the soul alone. This is the direct path and simple path to achieve a love of a fellow, be they large or small. And that is because on the level of the body, there will always be distinctions and differences between us. However, all of our souls are compatible, for we all have one father, and therefore, and it's for that reason that we are all called brothers, based on our source in the one God, and it's merely our bodies that are distinct. In the words of Rabbi Sachs, in this chapter, Rabbi Shneer Zalman explains that Jews are called literally brothers and sisters to one another. Because each Jew, each Jewish soul is in the one God. And therefore, we are really just one soul. It is only in terms of bodily presence that we are separated from one another. And just as there can be no divisions within God, so can there be no divisions within the collective soul of the Jewish people. Therefore, when we live at the level of the soul, there is unity among Jews. But when we live at the level of the body alone, there is disunity among Jews. When we live at the level of the soul, we fulfill the command that you shall love your neighbor, not as yourself, but because he is yourself. And it's in this moment of unity, in a very particularist Jewish sense, that Judaism is able to convey to the broader humanity a sense of what it means to be responsible for others as the great second century rabbinic work, the Mishnah, teaches us. Every single person is precious by dint of the fact that they were all created in the image of God. Today, in modern culture, we have a, a strong impulse to accentuate how people are different based on race, based on gender, based on sexuality, based on religion, and by affirming people's differences and distinctiveness and the distinctiveness of every person, we are somehow going to all come together in an understanding and in a relationship that will um, overcome division and overcome disunity. I believe that Tanya argues for an entirely different approach. One that doesn't love the other in spite of their difference, but rather goes beyond the notion of there being a difference in the first place. I'd like to finish with um, a quote from a 20th century Jewish philosopher, a French philosopher called Emmanuel Lavinas, who I believe is one of the modern manifestations of what we're trying to do here today. This combination of a printing of a seminal work of 18th century Hasidic thought in, although a very old building, but a modern university. The ability to, instead of playing both sides, thinking that there is a dis such a distinction that we somehow have to come up with a theory of how they all belong in the same building. Emmanuel Levinas was a traditional Jew, observant, of Torah and mitzvahs, and probably the most significant philosopher of his kind in his day. And although he learned the Tanya, he doesn't quote it ever, but central to his philosophy is a sense of responsibility for the other. And I found this quote, which I think um, paraphrases in some way the ideas of the Tanya, possibly in the language that is more attuned to um, the, the academic world. A responsibility without concern for reciprocity. I have to respond for another without attending to another's responsibility in regard to me. A relation without correlation or a love of the neighbor 
that is a love without eros for the other man and thereby unto God. Thank you. Yeah.